The revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Tommy Sunday Study featuring Chairman Omali Eshatella. My name is Akilia Nai, Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Today's study is highly important, and we encourage you right now to share this stream, invite your friends and family to it, so that as many of our people can be involved in this discussion. This week, the chairman continues with Vanguard Up, Unity of Theory and Practice, the political report to the first, seventh Congress plenary of the African People's Socialist Party, resuming from the section, turning regional work into regional hubs on page 33, and you can find the study materials in your Facebook and YouTube descriptions. In this study, the chairman goes in depth about the regional hub strategy, the critical party building strategy developed by Chairman Amalia Shetela to create political and economic hubs and grow the party wherever it is we are located. We will learn about the current work and the immense poli political potential we have in each region within the US and how the regions with this strategy will begin to see the tangible results of our efforts. We will bring in quality recruits, build entire communities of African working class intellectuals, and multiply our institutions of dual and contending power by putting them on the ground and into the hands of our forces wherever we are. Through this process, we are continuing on the path of becoming self-governing. This is part of what consolidates the African People's Socialist Party as the vanguard, not just our work to make revolution happen as the basis for creating this new world. We are determining what that world will look like right now by putting in place the structures and institutions that would help to shape that world today. It is an honor to be able to study this document, which serves as the blueprint for making a revolution with not just the author himself, but the leader of the African People's Socialist Party, the African Socialist International, the African International Strategist, our leadership, Chairman Amalia Shetela. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrades, brothers and sisters, I'd like to, um, first begin by sending a salute out to uh, the party uh, in Occupied Zania, South Africa, as it's, called, as it's called, the African National Women's Organization. I just had an incredibly significant uh, uh, pre-convention conference uh, in Soweto, uh, called South Africa, uh, where uh, in preparation for the uh, African National Women's Organization convention that's happening uh, later this month uh, in, in Philadelphia. The comrades had a pre-convention conference uh, in South Africa. Uh, most of the comrades in South Africa, m none of them will be able to leave there to get to uh, the 
convention uh, in Philadelphia in the United States. So uh, and, and from what we were able to see from here, it was an extraordinarily successful uh, conference, and I just wanted to salute you. And uh, it's further evidence that we're on the way and further evidence of the effectiveness of the regional strategy as well that we're working because that regional strategy is something that we are implementing throughout the world, not just uh, in the United States. So uh, I wanted to do that. And I wanted to remind us too that uh, uh, I'm extraordinarily uh, pleased with uh, the way the work is going now. That's not uh, for the party. It's not to say that we don't have contradictions. We do. Uh, but we recognize uh, that there are contradictions in all things. The, 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 prop, the thing, though, is in the, it, that these are contradictions that we're experiencing while in forward motion uh, to build uh, this revolutionary party, this revolution that we are struggling for. Uh, these are contradictions that uh, uh, we uh, encounter uh, in, in all things, in every way, all, every aspect of life. Uh, but the profound fundamental contradiction is that contradiction uh, that exists between colonialism uh, and freedom and liberation uh, that we characterize often uh, as the uneasy equilibrium that, that where we see uh, this contest between uh, uh, colonialism uh, and the struggle to be free and the people's will and struggle to be free as, 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 this, as they manifest themselves in the selves in the real world. We've uh, come from uh, our plenary. We had uh, the first plenary of the party uh, the beginning of, of February and the first plenary of our seventh Congress, beginning of, of February. And our seventh Congress, uh, we laid out a political report that uh, was pretty uh, significant, pretty involved, and uh, subsequently with the plenary we've just come from, we examining how uh, we went into to examine how the work was going subsequent uh, to that plenary, uh, to that Congress, and uh, to lay out how we have to move forward. And we found it really important to concentrate uh, on the regional work, development of our regions, uh, uh, to move the revolutionary project forward. And what that meant in many ways is that we unleash the, uh, the force and the ingenuity, the forces and the ingenuity uh, of uh, individuals and, and, and committees uh, inside uh, the party and in the movement that have responsibilities for different aspects of the work. We uh, are minimizing the direct control of uh, every aspect of the work from, by the leadership. It is not it is the, the leadership is now becoming more stratified uh, throughout uh, the party. And uh, every force in the party now is, is being called on uh, to carry out uh, the projects of the party, to carry out the resolutions of the party, uh, to win membership into the party, to uh, do all the work that has to be done. And now uh, we are entrusting, the party has entrusted this work in, in the hands, to the hands of the various committees and individuals. And when we said Vanguard, when we went into our seventh Congress, we were clear that when we were talking about Vanguard, it was a call for a recognition by uh, members of this party and movement to assume your responsibility of, of leadership. This is, this is something that's been important to us because it's an era now that some of us have to really struggle uh, uh, to contend with. It's an era where so many people now are locked into like social media and it is a, this whole social media uh, kind of process movement, the creation of cyberspace is something that has taken people away from relationships with each other. And so now we have a relationship with a screen uh, and a computer screen and what have you. And although uh, sometimes we claim to have hundreds and sometimes thousands of friends, there are people we don't know, never met, we'll never have a relationship with, we'll never organize in our communities and streets, et cetera. And we had a, we're talking about now countering that. In many ways, that's part of what it is that we're in contention with because this 
is something that has taught us a lot of bad habits. Uh, for example, um, many people can't even read anymore, uh, can't even tolerate reading. The, if it takes more than 20 minutes to get it, you know, uh, people can't, can't deal with it because there's a whole different assumption about when, when, when one is working like with social media, the amount of time that one is uh, expected to spend dealing with questions. Uh, and so this is part of what it is we're contending with, this whole period, this whole era. We are in an era now where we talk about revolution, but uh, where are the revolutionaries? Uh, certainly they are not just folk sitting behind computer screens. In fact, in most instances, counter-revolutionaries who are behind computer screens uh, trying to determine how the world is going to go. They're minimizing the whole role of human beings uh, in this process and in society. So we're contending with that. We're a different kind of organization. And we shouldn't be a different kind of organization in the sense that uh, our party is, a, is, is a one that came into existence uh, while uh, stemming from a movement that involved people and organization, real organization. Real organization is not getting a number of likes on social media, but actual connections that we make in the world and pull people uh, into some kind of uh, a process uh, that we've agreed upon, that, that we are f fighting to achieve certain kinds of outcomes collectively. We agree, this is what it is we want to do. Uh, and, but that's not, it's not like that so much anymore. Uh, increasingly, again, it's people in front of uh, computers, and now there's not much organization. We, we put stuff out, we get a number of likes, we get people to come to an event sometime if we're, if we're lucky, and then we speak to them, and then people go on their separate ways. I have participated uh, in, in uh, demonstrations. Uh, and I'm thinking right now specifically around Ferguson, uh, during the height of the resistance in Ferguson, after uh, this young brother was murdered by, uh, by the domestic uh, military forces called police in this country. And uh, I have seen actual demonstrations, mobilizations, where thousands of people attended the mobilizations. And the organizers were not trying to recruit anybody into organization. They made speeches, they got people excited. There was nobody with a pencil or a pad or contact sheets or anything like that. They just spoke to people and then and got people excited and then, you know, after that people left. Of course, what was happening was, for them, the people coming out with some kind of leverage that they would use with the, the, the colonial powers and say, look, you know, if you don't do something, these masters out here will make something happen. So we use this leverage, this bargaining uh, uh, means by which they could bargain uh, to get some kind of concession that they wanted, which were usually very small and minimal concessions. Uh, had nothing to do with... Uh, in most instances, even uh, evidence of some kind of social justice, some kind of remedy for the issue at hand. In this case, we're talking about the murder of Mike Brown. So that's not who we are. And I'm saying this because we're looking at a political report to a plenary. And the objective here is to win our commitment and active participation in changing the world not just explaining it, not just complaining, not just talking about it, but actually changing the world. And that's what the party is. And that's why many times people come into the party from this place from behind computer screens and have to have actual relationships with human beings and actually have to have relationships of discipline and to maintain this relationship, build this process, they can't hang, they can't handle that. Uh, this human thing is just too much for a lot of people to deal with. I mean, there's an, ideas can be pristine as hell. You can have these pristine, these ideas, they're pure. They're not contaminated by human intervention. And it's only when you start trying to make something happen in the real world, when you go up against the real world, and then you have to make this idea, uh, put it down on the ground. You have to get involved in the reality of, of human society, that can be complicated for people who only live behind computer screens, right? Uh, where behind computer screens, of course, we 
people have a tendency to just talk bad back and forth to each other on computers. It has no consequence. Just say anything you want to, and then you can unfriend them, and you don't have to deal with them anymore. That's not how it is. If in the world, you're talking about building a revolutionary project. Just can't go around unfriending somebody, you understand? <laughs> in fact, the thing is, you, there's a constant struggle to make sure that you're bringing more and more people into the embrace of the revolution and into uh, uh, revolutionary organizational discipline. So we're on page 33 here. And uh, we are talking about how to implement this regional strategy uh, that we are involved in and what's happening with the regional strategy. We're talking about uh, the, the, from the Congress, uh, Seventh Congress to uh, this plenary, which happened in February, something like, uh, uh, I think, almost, almost a year and a half, um, something like 15 months, I think. And uh, so, uh, and we left there, the Congress, uh, talking about pushing, putting the regional strategy into place. And now th this, this plenary, uh, we want to look at that and then try to advance that moving forward. So on page 33, turning regional work into, into regional hubs. A party has made a major accomplishment in establishing the regional strategy at our seventh Congress. We have reduced the number of regions included in our structure in the US and elected regional representatives for each of them. We reduced them because I think there were about six, five or six regions, and some of the regions were, were, were huge, but there were, only a handful of Africans in those particular regions. So we collapsed some of them into each other and, and reduced them to four instead of the number that we had previously to make it something that made more sense to us. However, we are continuing to grapple with having the regions function effectively. And our regional representatives have to be one to lead the regions if our strategy is going to realize its potential. And, and, and this may sound like um, uh, a strange proposition that the regional committees have to be one to lead the regions. But the, the fact is that it's a struggle to decentralize, to, you know, we talk about democratic centralism, but to add another component of democracy, functional democracy, into this democratic centralist uh, 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 process that we have now. So the thing is that the too much dependency in the structure uh, has uh, uh, been uh, conferred upon uh, the, 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 the central committee, the leaders of the central committee of the party. Uh, and what we're saying now is that uh, in the central committee, every, every regional representative is, it sits on the, on the central committee of the party. And we're saying that the, that regional representative has a responsibility to organize those committees in those regions and take on building those regions, wherever they are located, do it. And it's not just a matter of the quote unquote central committee, we're demystifying the whole notion of the central committee. You're on the central committee and when you participate in the meetings of the central committee, this is play where we report and this is where we get instructions and leadership coming from and then that goes, that you take into this developing these, these regional committees and making the regional regions actual dynamic components uh, of the revolutionary process. So, uh, and this is the struggle, having won the regional committees to take that on. Take it on, it's your baby. I don't need the phone call <laughs> most of the time. Uh, you do that, you take that on, you solve the problem and um, that's what it is that we're moving with. So the northern region played an important role in organizing for the successful November 1 through 3, 2019 Black is Black coalition rallies, uh, march and conference in Washington, D.C. So the northern region played a really important role in that. Under the leadership of, the re of regional representatives, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Matum, the regional committee did all of the propaganda work uh, in the area, especially Washington, D.C. They posted hundreds of big posters there announcing the Black is Back coalition events and did other work to win participation from Africans and others. Additionally, also in the northern region, INFIDAM, International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, is experiencing exciting growth in New York and appears to be on the cusp of consolidating a presence in Boston. Though we do not have a strong African organizational presence in Philadelphia, there is a large African base uh, for Chairman Amali Chitella and the presence of the Solidarity Movement is firmly rooted, 
stemming from the historic presence of the party going back for nearly two generations. Our expectations of party development and growth are reasonably high because of this historical advantage. And since this was written, of course, there is much more development in, in Philadelphia in terms of Africans coming uh, in uh, to the party work there. The northern region has also just inherited the exceptionally successful 15-year-old One Africa, One Nation flea market in West Philadelphia that until now was directly tied to the 25-year-old Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles store under the leadership of the Solidarity Movement. The institution is not only economically important to our regional hub strategy, uh, although the flea market benefits more than 100 vendors and their families, it is also patronized by thousands of Africans because of its cultural, economic, and political significance. The One Africa, One Nation flea market provides the, regional, the Northern Regional Committee, a consistent organized base from among its thousands of Africans' patrons from throughout the Northern region and beyond. And that's really important. Um, and however, with all the activity in the Northern region, some of which is quite successful, we continue to struggle for a unified, effectively led regional committee to give our work the necessary strategic leadership to achieve our strategy for building our party, forwarding the revolution, and consolidating the regional hub necessary for our growth and success. And this is an interesting, great contradiction that we're talking about because, you know, we look at actual effective work that's happening uh, in the northern region. We mentioned Boston, there's Washington, D.C., there's parts of Maryland and what have you. Uh, there's Philadelphia, uh, and there's the furniture store, and then there's the One Africa, One uh, Nation marketplace, and, there's a, and that's what, uh, 15 years old? Uh, 15 years old. Uh, the French store, which is like 25 years old. And it's an amazing, great contradiction that we have in terms of now uh, just consolidating, winning uh, this and winning the participation and leadership of the party uh, to continue to carry on and developing these projects. Uh, I mean, I, mean I, I can think of uh, two or three organizations that would beg to have that kind of problem, do you know what I mean? And to have these kinds of institutions, have this institutional presence, to have this dynamic relationship with communities and people and not just computers, right? Uh, and we wanted to commend uh, Kermit Nanaya uh, Muambi for his hard work and example, um, Matum, uh, for his hard work and example of developing political contacts and selling our journal, The Burning Sphere. All party members in the northern region are being directed to support Matum's leadership and break from the long-standing tradition of liberalism that has undermined our work and contributed to the existing intra-party resistance to regional committee organizational work. And this is a, this is a struggle. We want to identify, I want to say it here. Uh, liberalism is a, is a rotting, it's a corroding, horrible contradiction. It's not just, oops, you know, I'm liberal again, and that's it. It, it eats the essence of the organization, undermines the morale, it corrodes everything, it makes it impossible for us to be confident that we can go someplace because we know that there are liberals who are responsible for the work, so we say this is what it is, but we can't know for sure if it's going to happen at all because of liberalism, or if it's going to happen, whether it's going to happen in an effective way because of liberalism. So uh, even as we recognize what successes there are, and we recognize what has to be done, we know that it cannot be done effectively unless we're also contending with the liberalism that exists there, and that's real. And it's necessary for us to say that uh, and to call on the Northern Regional Committee uh, to, uh, to stand up and to vanguard up, to do what's necessary to, to build there in the North, uh, East and to North and to set the kind of examples we need for all of our work. And similarly, uh, in the southern region, we have the benefit of the party and movement presence going back to the 1960s, where in 1972 and 1976, the party and solidarity movement, respectively, were founded uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida. Currently, the party's international headquarters is located at the St. Petersburg, Florida Uhuru House, designated as one of our regional hubs of the party. The Burningsville newspaper and other propaganda institutions are produced in St. Petersburg. The sole party 
own Jiko kitchen that is responsible for major production for Uhuru Foods and Pies and local catering businesses is also located in St. Petersburg. I love this, you know, when we talk about, again, the issues and contradictions and problems, we're talking about institutions, we're talking about institutional presence where comrades are actually doing stuff and not simply sending out emails and going on social media, media and castigating this or that or et cetera. Actual organized, organized presence, institutionalized presence is there and it presupposes a relationship with people in the community, within the colony. Additionally, it was in St. Petersburg that we launched a politically, politically pivotal candidacy and campaign for city council pursued by Agiprop leader Akile Anai in 2019 with the anti-gentrification slogan, Make the South Side Black Again. That's incredible. And the previous 2017 electoral campaign run by the party through the candidacy of Akile, along with Jesse Neville, chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, was the first to place reparations on the electoral ballot in the world. The unity through reparations demand also propelled our 2019 campaign through the city, through the city council candidacy of Director Akile. Our electoral political work has been mostly confined to the southern region, although we have done electoral politic in Oakland, California in the past. We have gone into the electoral arena without any illusions, and we've also uh, done uh, uh, run a candidate in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, so we have gone into the electoral arena without any, through Comrade uh, Dia. Uh, <coughs> We have gone into the electoral arena without any illusions about the function of bourgeois elections within the U.S. and much of the world. They are merely, merely nonviolent contests between contending sectors of the ruling class, and as such they function as instruments of the state and as moderators of, of intra-ruling class competition for power. And I don't know how many forces really understand this about elections. There are people who we work with who are very smart people, uh, and uh, many of them are intellectuals, uh, which is to say that they work with their brains, you know, um, you know primarily. And, uh, but I don't think they get this, or uh, are able to really internalize this thing about what elections are. They take them extremely seriously. And while we have to take elections seriously, we, they, this is a serious event that's happening, it's not how most of them see it. They actually see uh, some contest between Democrats and Republicans. And they don't see that what we look at in terms of contest between Democrats and Republicans are ju actually intra-class struggle. This is struggle within the ruling class for control of the state. And the thing that the elections do is provide them with the, with the uh, ability to fight uh, for control of the state for their own profits and everything else without having to put their armies in the field and shoot each other. So they can have a nonviolent contest. They just spend a lot of money <coughs> purchasing this representative versus that representative. They create institutions, universities, universities and things like that to train people who will be the ones who, generally speaking, will be running for these offices of the bourgeoisie. They train them how to think in virtually every presidential candidate campaign. And sometimes uh, uh, other campaigns, the, the campaign managers are actual lobbyists uh, for various uh, corporations and things like that. They, they, uh, uh, corporate corporate uh, insurance companies wrote this, this Obama Affordable Care Act. I mean, it, this is where it came from. These are the guys who do this. So the, most people don't understand that. Many, uh, certainly most of the masses don't necessarily understand this, but sometimes those, those enlightened sectors from our own communities, intellectuals, don't understand. They, sometimes they understand in words, but they don't understand what that means. And part of the reason they can't understand what that means is because they are not in contention themselves for power. They're not fighting for power. 
they, they got good analysis, if you will, about what this one is doing and that one is doing, but if you're not involved in the contest for power, you really don't understand that. Because these guys are fighting for power. They wield the banner of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, they're for power. They're not just having some empty debate. And when you want power, there are things that you have to be willing to do, have to be capable of doing in order to get power. And these guys are contending with us because they have to have this foundation of mass support or the appearance of mass support in order to carry out this. This is the basis for them being able uh, to, uh, to say they have a mandate to carry out this policy or that policy of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie, the colonial bourgeoisie is a tiny minority of the population. Uh, but that is something that is obscured by the fact that they got millions of people who will vote this way or that way for the program of the, of the bourgeoisie. And not only that, they will offer the, con the, the interest of the bourgeoisie coming from a Democrat or from the Republican as the only legitimate options that are out there. So here the, the ruling class is holding up its interest on a Democratic banner or Republican banner uh, and then and saying this is the struggle, this is the fight. It's like sometimes you see on some of these, uh, these uh, talk, uh, commercial uh, uh, TV pro uh, news programs, that's what they call themselves, news, uh, and uh, where they, have, they put the left wing position and the right wing position. And both of them are the bourgeois position, right? And so you end up, which one are you for, the left wing or the right wing? And this is the kind of nonsense. I was in prison, and it was really interesting uh, because in prison, uh, uh, you've got these people who are locked up, uh, mostly colonized people, and if they ain't colonized, they what might be considered working class uh, people, uh, certainly it ain't the bourgeoisie that I'm locked up in the prison with. And they would have these debates about which prison guard, whether my prison guard can beat your prison guard, uh, you know, in some kind of physical contest, and that's the similar of what we're looking at in these, these elections. And uh, so, it's a contest between different sectors of the bourgeoisie. But I'm jealous of the power. You have to be too. We're jealous of the power. Of, and so we are in a big struggle with the Democrats and the Republicans for the loyalty of the masses of the African working class because the African working class must understand what its own interests are and they must be able to come into organization to pursue those interests independent of the interests of the bourgeoisie, no matter whether they call themselves Democrats or Republicans or Green <coughs> or uh, something else to that effect, or multicolored or rainbowed <laughs> or something to that effect. This is, this is what we are talking about. And, and so most of these people don't understand this. And the ruling class is horrible, it's filthy. I mean, it's got people now wearing masks and stuff like that, uh, uh, can't travel on airplanes, uh, they uh, engage in biological warfare to disrupt China, you know, the economy, uh, you know, and they call it cor a coronavirus and whatever. Yes, they did it. If you got a cold, they did it. I mean, it, the thing is that there's nothing that the bourgeoisie is not responsible for that impacts the people negatively. And if it comes, if it happens in China, it just happened that, that Pompeo, I think that's his name, the guy who is the, uh, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, is running around Africa and other places telling the masses, don't trade with China, don't trade with China. And it's not, and, and everything they're doing, the Huawei, the, the you know, the uh, electronic giant in China now is banned. You can't use them because they're stealing your secrets and stuff like that. There's a war that this government is involved in against China. <laughs> and when I say this government, it's a government that's presided over at least, at least uh, uh, apparently, uh, by the Democrats and Republican Party. These are the nasty guys. These are the nasty guys who are killing people all over Yemen, all over the Middle East, that are murdering people in the name of fighting against terrorism, poor people, starving people, whose resources are being stolen every day. Uh, the reason that you can go to any supermarket in this country and nothing is ever out of season is because that's how imperialism functions. Like the British used to say, that, that they have an empire upon which the sun never set. That's what imperialism is. So you can buy a mango in the wintertime in Florida when it's out of season for mangoes to happen. It's out of season in Florida, but not where the imperialist arms reach. The tentacles of the imperialists are everywhere. 
and they're starving people everywhere. So these guys that we're talking about, we're not just talking about your nice little local guy who runs for office and he offers up <coughs> some kind of narrative about how the hardships he went through <coughs> and his child who had this difficult, your child ain't had no difficult, your child doesn't even know what a difficulty is. Take that child and put it down in, in North St. Louis. We'll tell you what a difficulty is. Put that child down in the fifth ward in Houston, Texas. We'll tell you what a difficulty is. I don't want to cry. We don't cry anymore for you guys, but that's what they would have us do. The whole system is rotten. Yes. And so we involve ourselves in it, not to be married to it, but to cut the rot out, yes. to take whatever advantage we can in this process to, uh, to propel ourselves, to catapult ourselves uh, uh, into power, independent power. That's what it's about. So anyway, uh, uh, so we say that uh, our electoral political work has been mostly confined to the southern region, although we have done electoral politics in Oakland, California in the past and also in Philadelphia. We have gone into the electoral arena without any illusions about the function of bourgeois elections within the U.S. and much of the world. They are merely nonviolent contests between contending sectors of the ruling class, and as such, they function as instruments of the state and as moderators of intra-ruling class competition for power. That's what they do. That's what the elections do. <laughs> Nevertheless, since the 1965 advent of universal suffrage stemming from the struggles of Africans in the U.S., some people will say, well, if that's all they are, then the government wouldn't be killing black people to keep us from voting, wouldn't be doing everything they can to suppress the African vote. Yes, they would. Yes, they would. That ain't the big contest. They, they do this because this is the contest that they recognize as reasonable and significant. And in every instance, what is happening is one, when you're functioning in that, you're leaning on one sector of the bourgeoisie in its contest with another sector of the bourgeoisie. Yes, they will suppress your vote so that they can continue to hold the power in the relationship they have with the other bourgeoisie. You ain't voting for yourself. You're voting for the Democratic Party. You're voting for their program. You're voting for the program of that sector of the bourgeoisie. And yes, as a sector of the bourgeoisie, they will suppress your vote. And collectively, sometimes they'll suppress your vote all across the board. They will do that. Uh, so don't, don't find that remarkable. And they do that. <clears throat> Some people say, well, uh, and likewise, you know, well, the U.S. couldn't have uh, put the coronavirus out in the world because the, the U.S. economy is being affected by it. Yes, it is. And the U.S. health, people in the U.S. health being affected. Yes, it is. But the economy of the U.S. is effect, affected if China functions properly, like it's driving now, it's driving the United States out of existence. As the economy of the United States, the domination of white power is being driven out of existence by the movement, the trajectory of Chinese economy. It is being minimized every day. There's a the whole question of whether who's, who's leading today. What's the major econ economic power today? Uh, China was first, now second. Now, which is it? Which is it? And there's an obvious decline of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, capitalist power in the world. That's recognized. Wars are being fought around the world around that even today. Uh, low intensity warfare is happening all on the planet against the people in Iran and China, etc., all the time. And yes, you say, well, they're hurting their own economy with this. The economy is going to get hurt. It's going to get devastated anyway if China has its way. The healthcare system, you're talking about health, health? And China is, is driving it anyway, so stop China, even if it means uh, casualties on this side. Yes, the United States would do that. Yes, it would do that. So, nevertheless, since the 1965 advent of universal suffrage stemming from the struggles of Africans in the U.S., elections have been used as auditions for the African petty bourgeoisie and platforms through which the rulers can monopolize indirect authority or neo-colonial rule. 
So this is how the Negroes auditioned themselves for white power, through an election. Pick that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and some people, you know, are not supposed to make the cut. You see that all the time. You see them even after sometimes they might get elected against the wishes of the bourgeoisie. And there's a constant contest to undermine, to slander, to do other kinds of things uh, to make them insignificant. Plus, they never really get close to the levers of real power, unless it's a Trump. And that's something that, uh, you know, Trump actually had to marry, you know, uh, the other sector of the bourgeoisie, the really profound relationship, you know, because uh, he was, you know, he's a capitalist, he's a pig already. Uh, but he wasn't in the same, what do you call a hog pen? So they, to, to get in the hog pen, you know, he, there's a lot of stuff he had to do to be allowed to be in the hog pen with the other guys. So uh, electoral politics lost their luster, luster within the colony after the many years of Africans facing torture and death for even attempting to register to vote. This is related to the fact that as the struggle for universal suffrage was being waged and won, the U.S. government's counterinsurgent war on our people had resulted in assassinations of our leaders, mass arrests of our organizers, and destruction of revolutionary organizations. This pushed the profound revolutionary democratic issues we were fighting for off the electoral agenda, with African workers the victims of the agenda of the democratic ruling, of the ruling democratic party. So here you have a situation where Africans are fighting for the right to vote, to participate in, in the electoral process. There was no universal uh, uh, suffrage in this. Everybody couldn't vote. And so that's part of what this whole campaign was. That was a dem dem democratic struggle that happened in this country. The assumption being, of course, that Africans are uh, able to participate. This is the mass assumption. This is the mass assumption. Assumption with these nasty Negroes who, uh, most of whom uh, uh, commanded all of the space, political space in this electoral process, is that they could be elected and they could, be, they could join the white people, the colonizer, in making stuff happen. They didn't call them colonizers, they just called them boss. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, and what happens is that this was denied African people. I mean, people were... You know, people like to talk today, especially the African petty bourgeoisie, uh, how, you know, our ancestors fought and died for the right to vote, and now you little dummies, uh, you know, uh, uh, won't, you know, won't vote, and, and somehow that's a disgrace and how you doing all this nasty stuff because our people fought and died for the right to vote. But Africans did not die for the right to vote. Africans were struggling to be free. And somebody said, this is one way you can win your freedom is through the voting. This is what people were convinced of. <laughs> That's why people, people's churches were bombed. Children were killed. People were assassinated throughout this country, lynched and, and uh, the rest of that jail throughout this country. People faced dogs, uh, two-legged dogs, four-legged dogs, horse, horseback, electric prods all kinds of things like this. They were starved as a consequence of just trying to register to vote. This is what African people did. And now suddenly, you're going to tell us that, okay, people who went through all of that to vote, nobody in this country did as much to win the vote, the right to vote as African people. Not women. When I say women, I'm talking about white women, right? Uh, nobody, nobody, they were not lynching white women in this country. They were not bombing uh, white churches in this country. They were lynching, maiming, bombing, starving African people just for uh, trying to vote. And suddenly, you say, now you can vote, and now you won't vote. What in the hell is wrong with you? We don't have the dogs out there anymore. We don't have electric prize. We're not kicking you off the job because you vote. Why? Why won't people vote? Because they're too lazy, because they're betraying the history of our ancestors, uh, because they forgot what Martin Luther King did for us. <laughs> it's silliness, etc. So uh, what happened, of course, is that uh, 
Electoral politics, we say, lost their luster within the colony after the many years of Africans facing torture and death for even attempting to register to vote. This is related to the fact that the struggle for universal suffrage was being waged and won, that as the struggle for universal suffrage, suffrage was being waged and won, the U.S. government's counterinsurgent war on our people had resulted in assassinations of our leaders, mass arrests of our organizers, and destruction of revolutionary organizations. So we're fighting and winning this right to vote. But at the same time we're doing that, the U.S. government is killing leaders who were, Malcolm is dead, destroying the Black Panther Party who had a, t a revolutionary democratic dem uh, a 10 point program, uh, crushing anything out there independent of the U.S. government that was speaking to the interests of African people. This pushed the profound revolutionary democratic issues we were fighting for off the electoral agenda with African workers, the victims of the agenda of the ruling Democratic Party. Betrayal after betrayal of our people by the Democratic Party left the majority of our people cynical about the possibility of success within the colonial capitalist electoral arena that established and defined the parameters of legitimate political activity. Our work in this arena has been to destroy the monopoly of the African petty bourgeoisie in the elected role of publicly defining our reality in a way that facilitated a colonial agenda, neo-colonialism. I want to say that uh, we also saw this happen you know, uh, uh, in South Africa because, uh, uh, and I think it's really important to uh, define that situation in South Africa because an African people are, uh, are worse off today, the masses of African people are worse off today in terms of the actual conditions of existence, material actual conditions of existence than they were under apartheid. Uh, and the difference, of course, is that a handful of Africans have become filthy rich in, <laughs> I could have just said filthier or something to that effect, but, but, uh, uh, but it's at the expense of the masses. And these, just like in the United States, have become the symbols of, of the possibilities of black people. If we could just be like these guys, you know the system works, because look at these guys, right? And so that's evidence that the system works, uh, and that's what they've done. So now the big problem in South Africa is not the fact that white people, even today, own and control uh, uh, the vast majority of the land. I think it's 80 some odd percent of the land that uh, control all, own and control the industry. That's not, that's not the problem. The problem is crime. Who are the criminals? The black people are the criminals. Now, just yesterday in South Africa, everybody understood that Africans in South Africa were the most <laughs> oppressed sectors of humanity in the world. But now, like in the United States, the Africans are the criminals. Everywhere you look, it's Africans. Why would Africans be the criminals? Here, Negroes, who mo most of whom were in exile, were in exile, were in exile, had left the country, and in exile, or you had a couple like um, Mandela, who was in exile in prison, because in many ways he lived in prison better than the masses of people who were outside of the prison. Um, so you have this situation where, where uh, these are the people who go to power. <laughs> in the first year of power, I think the, uh, the budget of the government uh, increased something like 2%. But that 2% increase was, was not more resources coming to the African community. I mean, that's to say the budget going toward African people. It was just money that was moved around. So 2% more resources now went to the African community than before. And what happened is that the people who bore the brunt and this whole struggle of humiliation and oppression and death and prison uh, in the South African regime, and then the masses of people were supposed to be part of the revolution, recipients of the revolutionary benefits, ain't got nothing. 
ain't got nothing. And the revolution was supposed to change that. The revolution was to provide the houses because the white people got all the damn houses, had them then, got them now, with the exception of Zuma and, and <coughs> Ramaphosa and, and uh, you know, who, other people who are around them, freedom fighters and things like that as they characterize themselves. They, they got stuff, but the masses have nothing. So if the revolution was supposed to change all of that, and what the revolution did instead was give the white colonizers even more than they had before, and just a handful of the black people, there is no future for the masses of black people except taking it. And taking it is legitimate under revolutionary leadership, and that's why we're working so hard to build a revolution. That's why that meeting just happened on yesterday, was it? In, in, in Soweto with the African National Women's Organization, that's why the party is in the townships, and digging in in the townships on a daily, every day uh, right now. So we use the electoral arena to raise the issues that, are, that were essential to the revolution of the 60s and pushed out of the political scene by the electoral process acting as a counterinsurgency that included raising up a trader sector as the new leaders of our people. And that's what they did. I mean, they raised the whole trader sector the new, as new leaders of our people. They crushed the revolutionary movement. They harassed, and I think about Philadelphia. I remember the picture in the 1970s uh, where the uh, Philadelphia Police Department uh, uh, that was headed at this time by a guy named Rizzo who became the mayor of Philadelphia and how they raided the Black Panther Party. I think it might have been in December. And uh, they raided the office, and then they had them, and they brought uh, photographers and things with them, and they had the Panthers stripped, uh, and had them in their underwear, in their undershorts and stuff, uh, photographed outside to, as a form of humiliating the entire African community uh, and impressing everybody. This is, this is uh, 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 Philadelphia. This is how, uh, and this was the Democratic Party by the way, that we're talking about. Uh, Rizzo was a Democrat. Uh, Philadelphia was a Democratic city. And so here you have this attack on the Panthers. And then later you see how all these Africans who were supposedly progressives and everything, they come together, form uh, some kind of united front, and then they get this African who was a Democratic Party hack. He had never been involved in any political activity to support the mass of the people ever, independently. He had never been a part of any kind of progressive or revolutionary organization. He'd always been a Democratic Party hack. His name was Wilson Good. And they all got together. And they ran Wilson Good for mayor and got Wilson Good elected. Wilson Good is now the mayor. Hoofy, right? And then Wilson Good, what does he do? He ends up dropping a bomb on the African community that destroyed more than 60-some-odd houses, that killed 11 men, women, and children on the same organization that Rizzo had attacked uh, some years earlier. I think it was 75 when Rizzo first attacked them. Uh, uh, and there are people who are just getting out of prison now, right now, in Pennsylvania from the attacks that Rizzo made on them in the 70s, and then this guy, Wilson Good, an African uh, who represents white power in blackface, drops a bomb. Rizzo could not have done that and got away with it. Rizzo, as horrible as he was, and he was a nasty, he was a horrible human being, if, if Rizzo had dropped that bomb on that community in Philadelphia, this country would still be on fire because Africans would burn down every damn thing possible. This guy was able to do it because he was an African, because he was a neo-colonial stooge. And that's something that confused a lot of people. There is, I'm telling you, this, this class struggle is very serious. And uh, even, you know, you got people who want to say there is no class stuff, that's because they represent a particular class that does not want to be identified, doesn't want to be exposed. But that's what uh, this guy does, and that's what we're looking at when you have these neocolonial forces that's actually in the employ of colonialism, as, as Wilson Good was.
as what we have in South Africa today, right now, as we have this discussion in South Africa today, you got billionaires, African billionaires who are supposed to have been freedom fighters. You got the guy who was supposed to have been leading the workers' movement as a billionaire who is not a president. This is not like Maduro, who was a bus driver in Venezuela, you know. This guy is a billionaire. And he's in trouble now. The only reason he's in trouble is because he's been dealing with China uh, and Ramaphosa and another sector of the ANC uh, tied to uh, U.S. Uh, and what they call Western imperialism. And the masses, like the old African saying, something like when the elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. And that's what the masses are. And what we are doing, however, on the ground there, is we are utilizing the regional strategy just how, as we are in other places around this country, and we're building in the townships. That's why we just had uh, this meeting in Soweto. You know what Soweto is an acronym for, don't you? You don't. Southwest Township, Soweto. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this is part of what our electoral work accomplished in Florida. The burgeoning revolutionary agenda that the bourgeois defeated in the 1960s was back through the work of the party. And that's it. We resurrected the whole revolutionary project, and we went into their arena and fought them in their arena and made it impossible for the petty bourgeoisie to monopolize that space. The workers now are contending with them in that space, for that political space. So they cannot say that they have some absolute uh, they representative of the black working people. Now you have this stuff, now they have to say, well, the black community is not homogeneous. You, know, you hear that now more and more. You know, we got different opinions. We didn't have different opinions before we got involved. Before that, it was homogeneous sellout. It was homo homogeneously lick spittle. It was homogeneously uh, uh, reactionary. Now, when we are there to explain these different opinions, they want to neutralize the significance of the class being there by characterizing it as something that represents some, some error in thinking that the black community is homogeneous. We are homogeneous. We all of us against oppression and slavery and colonialism. And uh, that's what we represent. So we did not win our election in Florida in 2017 nor 2019. We learned and won a lot politically in the process. However, and a real victory is within reach going forward. We have developed uh, important relations uh, with, we have developed uh, important relations with African elected officials who are attempting to forward anti-colonial agendas. It is uh, with these comrades, New York Assemblyman Charles Barron and, and St. Louis Alderman Jesse Todd, for example, that we can begin to reasonably talk about establishing an organization dedicated to advancing anti-colonial electoral political work. This kind of revolutionary electoral work will render the ruling parties of the colonial bourgeoisie incapable of winning the loyalty of our people are defining the nature and direction of our struggle. Also now included as part of the southern region is Houston, Texas, where we temporarily institutionalized popular Juneteenth events. Our Fifth Ward Community Garden is, is planted every year on a plot of land that was acquired by the All African People's Development Empowerment Project, primarily through the leadership of now deceased and iconic party veteran comrade Omawale K. Fing. Huntsville, Alabama is the headquarters of the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project and home to Zenzeli, its principal economic development component. Zenzeli serves as the principal organizing tool for the party's work in Huntsville. APDEP is currently planning to initiate a regular international youth camp for young Africans who can learn important life skills, especially those necessary for understanding African internationalism and how to contend with all the manifestation of colonial capitalism. Our party also has supporters, allies, and an amorphous, amorphous base in Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, Louisiana, and other places in the region. Nevertheless, there is not an apparent coherent approach to the regional work in the South by either the regional representatives 
representative or the regional committee. There is little party membership growth in Huntsville and all of Alabama. There is also little evidence of party or NPDM growth in most places in the region, and we are not obviously working to recruit or befriend many of the southern regional contacts that are not part of our party or NPDM. The Midwest region. Most of the party's forces in the Midwest region are located in St. Louis, Missouri, site of our 7th Congress. The African community of North St. Louis is home to our most dynamic economic development work and our most recent Uhura House. Our work in St. Louis grew out of the party's intervention in August 2014 following the rebellion of the working class of Canfield Drive in Ferguson, St. Louis, in response to the police murder and desecration of the body of 18-year-old Mike Brown. Although rebe the rebellion was hijacked by the colonial bourgeoisie with the aid of the African petty bourgeoisie and aspirants who undermined the anti-colonial character of the uprising, the party was able to carry out our responsibility and create anti-colonial organization. Not only were we able to organize NPDOM in St. Louis, we also recruited and trained NPDOM's current president from among the African working class brought to political life with the August 9, 2014 rebellion. St. Louis is now its headquarters, and NPDOM has acquired its office in St. Louis. These are major accomplishments. And, you know, uh, we've gone through different uh, leaders uh, uh, in the NPDOM work. Uh, but what was really significant about this uh, situation is when we went into uh, Ferguson, St. Louis, and this said subsequent to the uprising, when we were there uh, in the heat of this uprising, and there's a whole new generation. This is what was so exciting and necessary for us to be there because there was, there was a whole generation being won uh, to uh, anti-colonial politics in the heat of struggle, heat of resistance. It's not like, just like somebody on the college campus that read about something or somebody, you know, uh, saw the latest film on Malcolm X or the Black Panther Party and were ins inspired. These were people who were on the ground, like most of us were in the 1960s. It was the heat of struggle that many of us came into re revolutionary life. That's why it would be very difficult for, to convince somebody uh, who was actually active in the 1960s in the movement that much of what we see today can be actually called organizing. You know, you stand on the corner and pass out a few flowers, that's organizing. Uh, um, and so you have these people come into political life during the heat of struggle, uh, where the police you know, are shooting at people, sometimes uh, using lethal weapons, sometimes not so lethal where you have uh, a counterinsurgency that uh, on the ground there that actually killed, quote unquote, mysteriously, several activists who were engaged in that struggle on the ground in St. Louis, where the white population in St. Louis bought up virtually all the guns and ammunition in St. Louis, bought them all up, where more than 100 FBI agents were sent in uh, to that city where millions and millions of dollars were spent uh, to try to contain and control that revolutionary project. I mean, this was, this was a, a, you know, like, a, you know, a revolutionary project. I mean, it was development, hot house fashion. You know, people come into this situation like hot house development that you had and potential for that development, depending on what you did with it. And that's where we met uh, Comrade uh, Kalambayi. In one of these demonstrations, she's out there with these demonstrations. I, there were whole families out, people who were not necessarily, you see, see two or three generations, a, a mother and a daughter and a, and a grandchild, they're out, they got their little, their little uh, cardboard uh, uh, signs that they wrote up themselves, you know, and, and sometimes they just come out and stand on the corner. The protest is extraordinary. And the... Uh, the, uh, the way Africans greeted and treated each other during the heat of this whole thing, it was, it was magnificent. And so this is, the, this is where we run into Kalambayi uh, on the net, who is now the president of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, <clears throat> and who uh, 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 came out as a decidedly different kind 
of a leader of this organization as compared to others that we have had in the past. And in a relatively short period of time, she, uh, she uh, went through uh, what it, uh, under ordinary circumstances, I guess you can call it ordinary, might take a you know, long period of time of uh, seasoning. And uh, that happened with her. And, and she's stone working class, stone working class. They got none of the affectations that you'll find with the petty bourgeoisie, uh, uh, none of the uh, petty bourgeois education, uh, miseducation, uh, as Carter G. Woodson would have characterized it, and uh, which meant that she was open. And she's been a different kind of uh, leader. So Infidum now has its headquarters there. Everybody else is gone. Everybody else is gone. They came in, you know, uh, they got the photo ops. You know, they were able to do selfies, you know, uh, with the police in the background and tear gas here and there, uh, et cetera. They got Soros money. They did. A lot of money. Them Negroes and some of them still are getting some of that money <clears throat> today. <clears throat> but we came in. <clears throat> that was, what, five, six years? August of 2014. And, and not only are we still there, we're building, and the African community is better off as a consequence of our being there. You know. So much of our work in St. Louis is in, uh, in St. Louis, the Midwest region, and the world revolves in part around the Black Power Blueprint. This is a major economic development project that encompasses the entire African community setting examples for and influencing African anti-colonialist aspirations globally. This work also gives practical meaning to the reparations demand of the party and is a clear example of how reparations work can be actualized among masses of people, the colonized and the colonizer alike. And you know, I just have to comment on that because this reparations issue, you know, is something that's growing daily. In fact, uh, there's a university in, in California that's denied me uh, the ability to come and speak on reparations because they said that I'm anti-Semitic. And I was saying that this ain't got nothing to do with Jews. This is not a discussion on Jews. This is a discussion on reparations to African people. And you are not going to make us change this discussion, change the subject. Uh, by making us fight you around the question of Jews. Yeah. We're going to make you fight us around the question of black people. Yeah. And that's where, where we are. Um, but this, this is an important thing because uh, there's a lot of work about reparations. We, we uh, pioneered this work. And we pioneered it and we wanted everybody to adopt the reparations demand. We wanted the petty bourgeoisie, we wanted sellouts, we wanted everybody to say reparations, 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 because, you know, we know that reparations ultimately mean something different to the African working class than it does to the African petty bourgeoisie. I mean, one of the leaders of this, uh, of, of, the, of the reparations movement, uh, that uh, opportunist faction that uh, came about subsequent to uh, what we had done, I think some seven years later, uh, decided that if you wanted to get your teeth fixed, or if you wanted to get your house painted, or a new car, new reparations, you know, this is literally what they said. And we've got it written down. This is a guy who, who uh, was characterized as the father of the reparations movement, you know. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, <laughs> so, so this is, this, we have a different opinion about reparations although we want everybody to come out for it because it's our job, the revolutionary job. The revolutionaries will make reparations meaningful. I don't give a damn what the courts do or what the, the Congress or the legislature do. I think we should fight on all those fronts. I think those fronts should be ways. But for us, the benefit of those fights is that it assists us in winning masses of African people to the question of reparations. You know, the Congress is not going to be one to reparations. The Congress will move, exp exp what do you call it, um, uh, if it's advantageous, po politically advantageous, they would do something. The courts will do something uh, if it's necessary. If the mass movement is, goes so significant, and there's an assumption that's obviously in the body politic in this country 
that the movement for reparations uh, is on an upsurge, and then, of course, would change laws and do things like that and offer some kind of uh, remedy that, don't, that does not challenge the actual status quo. I mean, they can find in the budget some more money for another poverty program or for another welfare program. I mean, Bernie is asking for $15 an hour and universal health care. They come up with a universal Negro uh, project that pays off African people. Okay, reparations is paid. They will do that. Those, if the masses demand it becomes so obvious and if it's necessary to do that to save the system from assault, they'll do that. Our recognition is that we take this to the masses of the people in the appropriate way. Don't give a damn what the court says, what the legislature says, the people will take reparations. And they will, can do so under the independent leadership of the, of the African working class itself. We make it happen. The, the courts, you know, they didn't, they, they, they justified our oppression and enslavement. They're not going to put put this on the ballot or on the agenda, the liberation of African people, we do that. And so, yeah, we say, everybody, reparations, reparations, reparations. And once this is won, then these people who are on the streets in South Africa or any other place, what they now call criminals, it, it gives them legitimacy among themselves, among the masses, and hence it affects the kind of demoralization that might occur when people who are starving and they know that you shouldn't steal anything and steal something to eat and they're thereby demoralized. No, you don't have to be demoralized by that. You are mobilized by the ability to take from the oppressor what has been taken from you. That's what, that's what it's about. That's what we, we, we make it easier for the masses of the people to find solutions to uh, oppression and exploitation. But that's another story. I just had to say that because the other thing about it is it gives us an opportunity to do another kind of work among the colonizers. Among the colonizers. And, and the colonizers, too, can break from a loyalty to like the system. And one way they do that is because they, they don't wait for the court to say it or for the legislature to say it. They can say, here's a project that, that speaks to ending this relationship uh, this oppressive, exploitative relationship we have with colonized people, I'm going to unite with that. This is reparations. This is my responsibility. And because people can hide behind this thing of the United States, behind the organization, what is your responsibility to this? Patriotism is something that has come about in this country and in most of the world as a consequence of a loyalty to the capitalist system itself, to the bourgeois state. That's what our patriotism is. In the United States, uh, that's why you got uh, nationalism, you know, like white, white, white nationalists, black, white nationalists, Mexican white nationalists, all kind of white nationalists. That's patriotism to the colonial state. Now, what we're saying is in that patriotism to that state and unite with the aspiration of the colonized, when, when put your future there with the colonized. Join with the colonizer against the colonized. Colonizer. Join with the colonized. That's, that's, what, that's what you have an opportunity to do. And people are done, have done that and are doing that. That's why the, uh, the, the, the reparations work that we do, even around uh, this Black Power Blueprint, uh, has uh, immediate direct support, immediate support in some uh, 130 cities in this country and, and some 30 some odd states in this country. Because there are white people who said, we agree, we unite with this. Here is the way uh, for the future and a genuine uh, relationship that can exist between peoples. Anyway. So NPDUM's presence uh, in the Midwest is active, actively exposing the contradictions of neocolonialism in St. Louis in particular. They are many. Uh, people are under open assault on a daily basis on every front of life. The Uhura movement provides the only political pushback in the defense, of, in defense and interests of the overall African population, and especially the African working class where the colonial contradictions are most concentrated. In addition to the population removal that weaponizes 
a city-owned land bank that hoards thousands of vacant homes and properties, the African community has to contend with the consequences of imposed poverty. This includes joblessness, food insecurity, intense competition for resources resulting in calamitous horizontal violence, and general community destabilization. Together, this is recognized as the classic strategy of counterinsurgency, population and resource control. The St. Louis political class is characterized by often publicized corruption that has led to wrist-slapping imprisonment of select government officials who have run afoul of some contending sector of the colonial bourgeoisie. Central to the corruption and the direction of the general political activity is the intent of the rulers to turn the majority African St. Louis into a majority white city. This has led to an ongoing media propaganda assault on the African community. Every instance of intra-colonial horizontal violence is gleefully responded, as, as, is gleefully this has led to an ongoing media propaganda assault on the African community. Every instance of intracolonial horizontal violence is gleefully reported as further evidence of a violence-prone community that needs to be contained for its own good. At least one neocolonial North American, um, at least one neocolonial North St. Louis alderman with close ties to at least one of the big developers has gone so far as to call for bringing in the U.S. National Guard for control, to control the people. Although it is unlikely that the alderman actually expected the National Guard would be deployed to his ward, his public call for the Guard served to contribute to an atmosphere designed to facilitate the removal of Africans from the city. With help from the colonial media, even Africans are being made, to, made afraid to remain in the North St. Louis community where the very real dangers are exaggerated. The war on the community contributes to the transfer of hundreds of acres of North St. Louis land to agencies for use by the U.S. federal government to establish a massive new National Geospatial Intelligence Agency headquarters. A combined force of big realtors, colonialists, defined developers, financial institutions, and local and federal office holders have coalesced to bring about the compulsory removal of scores of families through the power of eminent domain. At the same time, a move is being consolidated by the city government to liquidate the potential for any achievement of genuine black political power, a measure to reduce the number of city wards to 14 from the existing 28 is expected to go into force in 2021. Moves are also being made by local politicians to amend the ordinance to allow workers to be hired from outside the city in order to bring in police from neighboring municipalities, the excuse being an inability to hire police from the heavily unemployed African community. NPDOM has launched the only fight back against this counterinsurgent attack, assault. NPDOM has launched, launched the only fight back against this counterinsurgent assault that also employs African neocolonial office holders. The Uhuru Movement's Keep 28 campaign, along with demonstrations and organize, organizing work against the NGA spy agency, regular public community meetings and petition gathering to win community support for our efforts while expanding our economic development work is the essential anti-colonial work in the U.S. This plenary is about the unity of theory and practice. Neither theory nor practice alone is enough. Theory without practice is meaningless, useless, and practice without theory is blind. To make revolution, we must have both, each complementing the other. Nor is it enough to bemoan the evidence of imperialist rapacity infesting the world and impressing upon Africa and Africa's intolerable conditions. This is what colonial capitalism does. This is how it came into existence. But in so doing, capitalism was built, has built into itself the very contradictions that would cause its destructions. African internationalism is a theory that predicts the defeat of colonial capitalism.
the U.S. presents us with one of the ways that the colonial capitalist ruling class manipulates economic forces. There is a myriad of financial institutions to the detriment of our people and to the advancement of the ruling class and others. That includes the colonial petty bourgeoisie. Gentrification is the massive displacement of African people from our communities. Part of the counterinsurgent tradition of resource and population control that keeps our community is constantly off balance and off point. Gentrification can and must be countered. countered. State Assemblyman Charles Barron, a dedicated patriotic African elected off official in New York City, has stymied the effort of population removal in East New York by establishing policies resulting in his district gaining African inhabitants and keeping housing costs within an affordable range for many working class Africans. Our party is taking this on in North St. Louis. We have initiated a project of land reclamation and development that is consistent with the history of our party's struggle for self-reliance and self-determination, but with a much more focused and concentrated effort. Called the Black Power Blueprint, our campaign has already resulted in a trajectory in North St. Louis that has anti-colonial implications for every community within the U.S. and elsewhere. There are lessons here for everyone, and we are seeing an amazing transformation taking place before our eyes. Long demoralized, the impoverished, dilapidated African communities surrounding the busy thoroughfare of West Florissant at Alice Avenue, where the Uhura House and the outdoor event space was located, are coming to life. Long demoralized, the impoverished, dilapidated African community surrounding the busy thoroughfare of West Florence and at Alist Avenue, where the Uhura House and the outdoor event are located, are coming to life. The 50-foot flagpole holding the 25-foot red, black, and green flag has visibly brought pride to the community. African people bring their families to see the photograph, to see and photograph the beautiful flag waving in the wind. The Black Power Blueprint has begun to change the material conditions within the colony, creating a general outlook that raises reasonable expectations for a safe and prosperous life in our own black working class community. Moreover, this is not something done for the community by the government or any neo-colonial elected official, but in spite of them. The Office of the Deputy Chair in the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement are building a growing base of supporters from the neighborhood. One pop popular cultural worker who lives on Alice Avenue testified at a Sunday rally that his family made the decision to remain in their home rather than move because of the Black Power Blueprint that is a vibrant symbol of African economic and cultural development. He said that he sees the changes in the neighborhood and noted that young Africans that he used to see on the street corners are now employed by Africans fixing up their homes. One young African businessman from down the street has joined the Black Power uh, Blueprint Committee led by Comrade T'Chawa Masimba, the Economic Development Director of the Office of the Deputy Chair. He says, he is now inspired to invest in commercial property and build businesses in his neighborhood. There is Mr. Gary Brooks next door to the event space who has played a leading role in creating the garden and the preacher from the church next to Mr. Brooks who offered his empty lots for parking when the big events take place. There is Sister Helen, a pastor who speaks once a month at NPDM's faith-based Sunday rally. There is the excellent coverage from Channel 4 which interviewed T'Chawa on the significance of the Black Power Blueprint and showed footage uh, of the construction that was underway. There's NPDOM's door knocking uh, on College Avenue in West Florissant on the block where the Black Power Blueprint's African Independence Workforce housing is located next to a now empty lot that we have targeted for an outdoor basketball court. On an impoverished block, our comrades got signature, signatures on petitions and testimonials from community members saying that they too consider themselves Uhuru. <coughs> the Midwest region also encompasses members in Chicago, a city of outstanding significance because of its history of resistance 
national demographics and ever ripening, glaring political and social uh, colonial contradictions. Our work in St. Louis has provided the party with the ability to appoint a new regional representatives following the practical disunity that forced the resignation of the person elected to the post at our seventh Congress. Comrade Malika Zaire Alexander, our newly appointed regional Midwest regional leader appears to be establishing the template for building our regional hub. She has developed a plan of action that encompasses the presence of NPDOM, the Solidarity Movement, and the party. Comrade Malika has also struggled to make the regional committee a real functioning component of our organization's structure. Her approach to implementing the regional strategy will help to establish the template for building and developing our regional party work and structure. The Western Region. Should we do this or should we go now to uh, we do the Western Region? The party's Western Region is also currently being led by a new representative, Comrade Bakri Olatunji, a veteran of our movement whose primary work is tied to economic development under the leadership of the deputy chair, was appointed to this post in order to facilitate the regional strategy. And I want to say that uh, this should not uh, how that was stated should not infer uh, that uh, Bakri um, is not a competent force to do this work. Uh, he is a veteran. Uh, at one juncture, Bakri uh, led the, uh, uh, the Bobby Hutton African People's uh, Free Clinic. We had, a, had initiated a mobile clinic uh, in Oakland, California, where we actually took, uh, we, uh, we uh, rebuilt a, a recreational vehicle and turned it into a mobile clinic that we took to the most impoverished uh, projects in 65th and 69th Ville in Oakland, California. And Bakri had that work. And Bakri, Bakri was a nurse, and uh, he uh, uh, was part of the project where we attempted to establish a clinic uh, 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 on, on Foothill, uh, and that, that this, this religious order uh, said they were going to give to us uh, until we rejected uh, their suggestion that we name it for Martin Luther King and instead said we wanted to name it for Bobby Hutton, you know, who was the uh, African who was murdered by the Oakland Police Department. Uh, but Barkery, you know, has been there uh, involved in this kind of work for a long period of time. In fact, it was Barkery uh, who at the time was working at Highland Hospital as a nurse who uh, called me early in the morning to let me know that Huey P. Newton uh, had been brought in and that he had been shot and, in the head and he said that he's dead. And this was before you know, like the media was able to say that he was dead and uh, gave us the heads up to do things to uh, really build a competent response uh, to his assassination and to how the bourgeois media tried to frame that. So Bakri, he's been there for a long time uh, in the movement. Um, <coughs> so Bakri's work is to establish leadership over the task of building the party in this important region. Barker's formal assumption of the role of Western Regional Representative was his acknowledgement that our regional strategy requires organization and a leading force in every region for success. Again, it was extremely important to establish the regional representatives throughout our party structures. This is the only way our regional strategy can be realized and responsibility for the dynamic growth and development of the party be shared and made operative throughout our ranks. This is the means by which we can make all our leaders and work accountable under democratic centralist principles. This makes it easier to duplicate successes and to identify and correct errors. There's much more to be said about our successes, but too little has been said about our failure and errors. The top of the list of errors, and I should say the Western region, we are 
uh, the Western region is being uh, uh, consolidated. Uh, we have forces uh, not only uh, uh, in Oakland, California, but San Diego, California. Uh, we have uh, allies and connections with Union de Barrio uh, in San Diego and Los Angeles and uh, also in, in uh, San Jose, California. We uh, uh, have uh, forces uh, in, uh, in, in, in Seattle uh, and, and some in Oregon. And, you know, so the regional work is, is happening. And, and, and more and more forces are assuming responsibility within the regional structure, the regional committee. Uh, the, the top of the list of errors must include the general lack of leadership of our regional representatives. That includes, but is not limited to, a failure to create effectively regional, functioning regional committees. This robs the region of their strategic character. The successful dynamism of the regional work will be determined by its inclusion of all active participation of actual committees collectively defining and working out the details of the work. Every one of our regions is rich with possibilities for the growth and development of the party and the advancement of the revolutionary work to totally liberate and unite the African continent and the forcibly dispersed African nation under the leadership of the international African working class. Yet although we have provided the structure and general blueprint for successfully carrying out the work, in most cases, and although we have provided practical and ideological training, our regional representatives have shown too little initiative, creativity, and leadership to advance and forward our revolution and our, and our party. In the first place, as has been mentioned, too few regional committees have completely assumed responsibility for leading our regions. No plans are being actually carried out to build party organization in the states and cities in most regions, and there are no coherent, practical, organized, strategically based efforts to, at work to fill the ranks of existing and projected party organizations. Of course, this was a political report that was written some uh, few weeks prior to the February uh, uh, first plenary. And this is changing. I mean, this actually change in development has occurred even since this was written. So we do you know, see uh, development in all the areas that we're talking about. In fact, the plenary itself was, in this report, was uh, one that was designed to push it, to push it, to push it. And what we are uh, doing now is with this, oh, going through this political report, and we will do this over and over again. We will do this over and over again, uh, really reinforcing the political report to make it something that we own, all of us own. Uh, uh, so that's why we are talking about it now. We're reminding ourselves of the mandates and resolutions that we created, established, uh, uh, the strategy, the tactics that we are using. We are reviewing that. This is what part of this whole process is about. Uh, we say that uh, this is how the regional work uh, contributes to multiplying the distribution of the Burning Spirit newspaper hundreds of times over. This is how the party turns every African community into conscious bastions of anti-colonial resistance. This is where the revolution is, I'm telling you. It, it, turning the whole community into active, conscious opponents of colonialism. Not just the white guy don't like us, or except act, active, conscious opponents of colonialism, transforming entire communities. That's what that's what it is that we are doing. Uh, that's why we have, you know, we occupy ourselves, seize, hold, uh, and develop. That's a process that we are using. We occupying communities, areas of territory, because there's no revolution that's ever been made any place that did not occupy territory. You, that's occupation, occupying territory is fundamental to the question of revolution, and even winning elections, even. People, groups that we call gangs, understand this quite clearly. You occupy a territory. That's why you've got the red and the blue and what have we. We say the red, black, and green uh, has to be uh, the flag of this whole revolutionary project, occupying territory every place. This is how we establish local community Uhuru houses and cities and communities throughout the world. 
And it is a problem that the regional representatives have not yet opened centers with a dynamic and staff political presence, with sales of the spear, party books, buy black power products, political events and community meetings. This is also the means to establish party leadership throughout our organization from the basic organizational cell to the regional representative. This is how we exponentially grow the reach and capacity of our economic institutions by broadening the market for our products and ventures within our massive movement and throughout the African colony and beyond. This is, in fact, you know, we talked about what's happening in Soweto with ANWO, the African National Women's Organization Pre-Convention Conference. But we're also doing economic development work there. I mean, the plans of action for the economic development work that we're doing in South Africa now, they're unfolding uh, right, before, right before our eyes. And so this is how we grow. We, every region, somebody has to be responsible. And Comrade Tafari Mugari, uh, who oversees, uh, who, who is the leadership of the party in South Africa, has also become uh, the director of organization for most of our Africa work. We'll be traveling soon to Ghana uh, to work with those comrades in, in consolidating our presence in the best way there. We have party forces in Ghana. Uh, uh, Tafari will go in as director of organization and help to establish that so that we have an actual dynamic presence uh, in Ghana and various other places where we are located. The thing is not just to be on social media, but to actually occupy territory, occupy <coughs> territory <coughs> politically, ideologically, organizationally, economically, every possible way uh, the objective is to actually occupy territory. That's what dual power was all about. So uh, this is how we exponentially grow the reach and capacity of our economic uh, institutions by broadening the market for our products and ventures within our massive movement and throughout the African colony and beyond. This is how the party assumes real complete leadership of our economic institutions by filling our ranks with the necessary cadre to do the job. Our regional strategy provides us with the organizational wherewithal to rapidly forward our mission as the, as the advanced attachment of the African Revolution and the revolutionary vanguard of the African working class. I'm going to, let me just, our regional strategy provides us with the key elements for growth and development, and we are mandating the entire party to set the implementation of the regional strategy as our number one priority coming out of the plenary. There's nothing to it but to do it. Implement the mandates at the end of this political report. Set the goals and implement the strategy. Find the office, fundraise, set up by black power, go door to door in the neighborhood, hold weekly fundraisers and spear studies. By next year at this time, we will be miles ahead of where we are now. Come in. Uhuru. We want to give Chairman a round of applause for that amazing study. Um, and I just wanted to say, Chairman, that just a moment ago, um, we're still on YouTube, streaming on YouTube, but Facebook cut us off. So, not, um, not sure why, but so our Facebook audience is no longer. Um, but if, well, I can't say if you're on YouTube. <laughs> if you're on Facebook, go to YouTube. Um, but we could probably make a post right quick telling people to tune into the YouTube stream. Um, but this is, you know, why the revolution has to be on the ground and not on social media. Um, we did have um, a moment ago um, before Facebook cut us off. Um, we always like to say where people are viewing from. So we have people from Belleville, Illinois, St. Louis, Missouri, Clearwater, Florida, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Boston, Massachusetts, Chicago, Illinois, Virginia Beach, Virginia, Kuwait, Tampa, Florida, Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Hampton, Virginia, San Diego, California, um, Ulm, Germany. Um, Ooh, I don't know how to pronounce these uh, names. Um, Limpopo, South Africa, Kampala, Uganda, Dubai, Huntsville, Alabama, Cincinnati, Ohio, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we had salutes um, for various people uh, throughout. Um, Roy Broussard in Kentucky says, Uhuru comrade, chemical warfare, you're so right, Chairman, in regards to talking about the coronavirus earlier. Um, Kitty Riley in St. Louis, Missouri, saluting Chairman Amalia Chichella in the African People's Solidarity. Um, 
African People's Socialist Party. Kitty Riley is in St. Louis with the African People's Solidarity Committee. Deputy Chair Onizene Ashtetela commented, liberalism rejects ideological struggle and stands for unprincipled peace, thus giving rise to a decadent Philistine attitude and bringing about political degeneration in certain units and individuals in the party and the revolutionary organizations. Um, Raymond Moses in Trinidad comments, critical, Uhuru, ill with the chronic virus of capitalism, try the black power blueprint, right. Uhuru. Mm -hmm. All right, so to get into some questions, we have Teresha Gordon in Fort Wayne, Indiana, says Uhuru Chairman Amalia Chatella, do you foresee the increasing censorship of cyberspace as an opportunity to seriously mobilize the African working class? I think that cyberspace just answered that question. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, yeah. Yeah, obviously that is, uh, we can anticipate that more and more of this. Uh, in fact, they've been shaping the debate for some time now about, uh, about uh, censorship. Uh, they've been characterizing uh, anything that, uh, uh, that criticizes the United States, especially from the African community and other oppressed peoples, as uh, something that's Russian engineered, it comes from Russia, et cetera, and then they've used this also as the basis for uh, uh, for censorship, yeah, definitely. And we're going to see more and more of that kind of stuff, but even that uh, uh, will become less effective uh, because people, we do find other means of communicating. We were communicating really effectively even before uh, the, you know, this cyberspace uh, project that took people to these, I don't know if you can call it extraterrestrial or not, I mean, uh, but these other places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Comrade Tachara Masimba in St. Louis um, asked, her chairman, can you speak about how decentralization contributes to the rapid development of the forces of production and to our ability to build an international African economy? You really want me to do all of that, <laughs> Tachara? But the thing is that uh, it unleashes the genius of the people. And it's one of the criticisms I have, and I spoke to some third grade students not too long ago, and telling them about the significance of reading, uh, that uh, allows one to use imagination, which is, uh, which is crucial. We bring our own experiences into the stories and things that we read about. But when we get told, shown these things, uh, even through through videos, et cetera, uh, somebody else tell, teaches you how to experience this, how to understand, how to think about this. And, and we, with the decentralization, uh, people have to solve problems as they really are. It's not just somebody somewhere else, you know, saying how to solve the problem. We can set the strategy, we can uh, establish strategic goals and things like this. But this stuff has to be happen on the ground. Uh, with your neighbors, with the people who work in the same plant that you work on, with the people in the same prison wing. That's where your genius and the ingenuity comes into play. We can establish uh, certain kinds of economic development uh, strategies. Uh, we have uh, done that, but the comrades uh, in South Africa are going to have to put this down on the ground and have to, they have to say this is how it has to look in order for it to be successful. They have to obviously remain true uh, to this uh, overall strategic objective that we've established for ourselves, but it relies on their genius uh, to make it happen. How can I tell you from, uh, from uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, or from uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri, how uh, to organize uh, your community uh, in the fifth ward of Houston, Texas? I mean, I can give you a basic outline, and I can give you organizing tips and training to be an organizer, but you have to take this out on the ground and you have to come up with your own, and in the process of doing that, you will learn things, then you will be able to teach me some things about and teach everybody else how to do this stuff. And so uh, this, is, this is critical. And this, is un this unleashes the genius of the people. The people have an opportunity to participate in, in defining and solving uh, the problems that we are confronted with. And that's especially true in a place like St. Louis, uh, uh, where there are so many possibilities. And of course, as we know, with every possibility, there's a thousand uh, contradictions that uh, also await us that we have to contend with. Uhuru, yeah. Uhuru Chairman, really appreciate the study. I have one question and one which will qualify as a comment or a question. 
So the first one that I have is like you talked about uh, power jealousy, and I wanted you to expand uh, about power jealousy in the context of geo and contending power. And the second one that I wanted to talk about, or wanted you to talk about, is also about uh, in the context of elections, the whole uh, concept of non-violent contest. Uh, I wanted to compare that with uh, the whole uh, green quote-unquote green revolution of having green cars, green energy where the question is, oh, how can we get the most efficient green car? Uh, we talk about electricity, but most of the time the electricity that the, the instruments of obtaining the electricity comes from minerals from Africa, or uh, uh, the instruments of the clean energy is basically based on further exploitation. So I just wanted to like uh, get your opinion on both of these. Yeah, you just asked me to redou redouble my condemnation of, uh, of imperialism and and oppression and exploitation of peoples. Colonization is, is uh, uh, actually the extraction of all value, you know, uh, 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 from the people. The first aspect of that had to do with uh, uh, the... Power jealousy. Yeah, I mean, I was, what I was so struck by all of these Africans who were supposed to either be communists or they were supposed to be some kind of nationalists who were fighting for self-determination. In fact, they call themselves the provision of governments and what have you, of black people. And then uh, the US government uh, uh, secured uh, the positioning of, of its representative called Barack Hussein Obama uh, <clears throat> as, the, as the leadership, as the you know, obvious leadership uh, of the government. These guys, how do you, how do you then if you don't have anything else, if you don't know anything else about Obama, or even about that much about politics, how can you not be opposed to the United States government sticking somebody else up, even though it's black, and saying, you know, I'm supporting this guy. You know, you have to be jealous of this whole question of power. It's our power. It's our power. It's not to be shared with the United States government or any other force like that. It's the power of the African working class. That's what I mean, the jealous, this is jealous power. This is jealous power. We, we don't share this power. And uh, uh, so that's, that was really interesting for me uh, to see uh, the, the so-called provision of government of black people who were supporting Obama. And there were others who did that. I mentioned provision of government, and some I'm not mentioning now, but who were all Obamas, some communists. How are you communists talking about the power of the working class? Opposed to imperialism, except, <laughs> and of course, much of that was uh, the fact that much of the leadership of our struggle, going back, you know, even to the 60s and what have you, has been the African petty bourgeoisie, even if it's a radical petty bourgeoisie. And they, uh, many of them were mobilized because, uh, not because of this relationship as such, except this relationship prevented them from ascendancy. So it, with Obama there, but by the grace of God go I. And you know, I think that was a sentiment that we saw express itself with the election of Obama as far as some of the African uh, forces. I mean, I know some Africans who uh, participated in 1972 in this uh, event in Gary, Indiana, uh, this National Black Convention, of where there was supposedly that this contest between the, uh, the nationalists and the uh, moderates about uh, the black elected officials uh, about who would represent the interests of African people as though they were fundamentally different. And there was, you know, a people who, you know, really, ch you know, championed black nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've seen them. I saw them supporting Obama. I've seen them do other horrible stuff like that uh, and, and unapologetically. And they, they refer to themselves as Marxists and what have you. So uh, that's not jealousy, you know. I mean, you have to be jealous. How are you going to have the working class, you know, turn over power to, to Obama? Or how are you going to have the, <clears throat> the nation that you seem to uh, be leading uh, or the government that you're establishing for African people uh, concede uh, leadership to the United States government because there's an Obama? Uh, so that was one aspect of it, and then the other was uh, the, the thing about uh, this is a fundamental question that we find ourselves always having to deal with. You raise the question about all this Green Deal, the new Green Deal, and the green energy, et cetera, based on resource coming from Africa. 
<laughs> and uh, that's why African internationalism and our presence is so important uh, because that's where they will go. In many instances, they will go some of the same communists that we just talked about, some of the same, in fact, that's where you see much of the support coming for the New Green Deal, some of the same nationalists that we're talking about will find themselves saying, doing the same thing the other imperialists do. All the imperialists are talking about Africa and taking resources out. The question then becomes competition for who's going to get uh, access to those resources. Class struggle most often uh, in, in, in the world, uh, certainly uh, in, Europe and, in European centers, uh, is contest between uh, the African, uh, between uh, 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 what is characterized as, as, as white workers and the bourgeoisie for control of resources, assets that's being stolen from African and other colonized people around the world. That's what they characterize as class struggle, ultimately. And they don't recognize the fundamental c c uh, class question is concentrated in the colonial contradiction. It is the colonized people versus all that stuff. That's why, you know, we even saw people who we love, like Hugo Chavez, you know, who was giving support to all these neo-colonial African countries, because he was being sympathetic to Africa. So all these neo-colonial puppets who dominate and oppress Africans, he was supporting them. Uh, uh, and we've seen other forces do a similar thing. I'm supposed to be in Russia uh, uh, sometime next year at this conference of uh, international uh, conference uh, uh, of uh, people for self-determination, right? And uh, uh, we have to win this question in this mass of people, people from all around the world, but Africa is colonized, and some people who are in this room now are looking for a particular kind of relationship with South Africa, which is a, which is a neo-colonial settler, neo-colonial entity with other countries, you know, people, they're doing the same thing. Uh, so we have to make that struggle to help people understand uh, that Africa is going to be free. It's going to be free. And so you, if you want to really uh, put your resources uh, where energy is involved, then you need to be betting on the revolution because we, our objective is to tear that stuff down. That you, you banking your future on that. I'm banking our future on that being destroyed. Yep. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yeah. Uhuru, Chairman. Well, um, we're gonna close it now. Um, bring it because we got about about five minutes left. But I just really again want to salute you and this amazing uh, study. Just appreciate you going through this with us today. And um, just wanted to say that uh, this, uh, you know, in regards to the whole Facebook um, and YouTube thing, um, we are really encouraging people to subscribe to the Burning Spear TV YouTube page um, for um, because of this increasing issue of you know Facebook continuing to censor the chairman and the African People's Socialist Party. So like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube. And because of Tom, we want everyone to know that if your question was not answered, one of our moderators will correspond with you and make sure that the chairman sees your question. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, winning the war of ideas. For your, rev for your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For revolutionary radio, dynamic shows, and music by Africans all around the world, tune into Black Power 96.3 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android, or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPOhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. Order your copy of Chairman Amalia Shetela's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, The Political Report to the Seventh Congress at burningspearmarketplace.com. On March 27th to 29th, coming up right at the end of this month, the African National Women's Organization will be holding the Black Women's Convention, Sisters United for Revolution, in Philadelphia. Registration is open for this dynamic event at anwobwc.eventbrite.com. Come see the leadership of revolutionary African women on the front lines for revolution. Featured here will be presentations from African women in our party and movement, workshops, culture, and so much more. For more information about the convention, visit convention.anwohuru.org. The Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations is hosting its fourth annual electoral campaign school in St. Louis, Missouri at Aquaba Hall, 4101 West Florissant, on April 10th through the 12th, themed The Ballot and the Bullet. The school is a means by which the coalition opens up a new front for black people, for black self-determination within the US and elsewhere. The school will teach ordinary Africans, workers, activists, women, and youth how to run for office. 
The weekend of events will include presentations from members of the BIB Steering Committee and other special guests. Visit blackisbackcoalition.org for more details, including registration and our list of featured speakers. Thank you all for tuning in. Again, make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Taught Me Sunday Study. Uhuru.